Montfort. I'm a researcher at INRIA. I'm part of the parietal team. And I've been a contributor and a co-author of Scikit-Learn since uh, 2010. I learned a bit by looking at code of other people doing my PhD, but I was mostly programming on my own. Um, and so, I mean, I don't think you can really learn programming in books. Uh, if you want to learn how to program, you should read good code uh, or program with people who are good programmers. I, I guess these days you have websites like GitHub or uh, at that time when we, <laughs> my PhD was SourceForge was more the standard than GitHub, but uh, you could access to open source code that was a uh, pretty good. But uh, I think, yeah, really for me, the, the, the way to learn was to program with more experienced people. This started roughly uh, end of 2009, early 2010. Um, so the team I belong to it at INRIA is working on neuroimaging applications. So looking at how the brain works with images and signals. And at that time, we we felt that there was a bunch of people around us losing, at that time, uh, support vector machines or these types of machine learning techniques to look at the brain. And the tools to do this were not so easy to, to use. And we needed tools that other people, like intern teams uh, or really like people doing cognitive neuroscience or clinical neuroscience to be able to use our tools. And uh, there was a need to have a, a software package that would simplify the access to machine learning for these types of people. In the end, now it also allows us to do things much more, much faster than we used to be. It's not the first machine learning package that you had in Python. Before you had something called MDP, you had also another one which was called PyMDPA. There was other like initiatives to have, scikit to have Python machine learning packages. But Cyclean was started uh, uh, with, I would say, a clearer scope and much uh, more rigorous development process. And maybe something that was specific to Scikit-Learn is that it was not meant to be application specific. It was not meant to be for brain signals or brain images or chemistry or physics or anything. The input objects to Scikit-Learn are numpy arrays. Okay, so the, the, the minimum that you need to, uh, to work with numerical data in, in Python, uh, there's a few things that are related to text processing or very like a few functions for images, but it really, was really meant to be a core algorithm that people could build on for other disciplines, uh, but there was no application specific code in Cyclone and it's still the case. I think it was a huge, uh, um, yeah, a, a huge push for Python in, in, in data science. I see it at multiple levels. I was typically teaching in Telecom Paris for five years. And before I started, all, everything was either in MATLAB or in C. And when you start to do machine learning and you see all these nice examples online, so it's easy to make examples, it's easy to make hands-on, it's easy to, to do live demos and, and to have people and to have students really start to get something done quickly. Uh, so it really pushed Python in education, but also in, I would say in research. You have a lot of scientists around us that use other languages, but when it starts to go into machine learning, they switch to scikit-learn in Python uh, or other libraries uh, these days. We want people to contribute to scikit-learn, which is really a scientific computing library. So the people who can contribute to scikit-learn, they typically have a math background. They, um, they are not CS programmers. So you take the people who know how to do this and the people who know how to do the mass of optimization and machine learning, you take the intersection, it's close to zero. But the benefit of Cyton was for us that it looked very much like Python. So the entry, the barrier of entry was very small. If you look at Cyton code, it's really looks, feels pretty much closer to Python than anything else. So it was easy for us to say, okay, just add a few types to your Python code. Here's the few tricks you need to know. It, you can still read the code and it will be much faster, at least for some parts. We, so we have cited in a few parts of scikit-learn, typically the trees, random forests, uh, all the coordinated descent techniques in linear models. The nearest neighbors are also using heavily cited. 
So something I really like about open source is uh, meritocracy in the sense that uh, the people who get uh, the power, the people who get the, uh, uh, the respect from the community is the people who invest their time and uh, have proven that they've done valuable work for the community. It's, it's really well documented and also it's documented by examples. It's not technical documentation like uh, here's the class one, class B, and a class B inherits from class A, which would be a technical description. The documentation of Cyclicon is here's data, here's how to use it, here's what you look, here's what you look, what you, what you should be looking at. Really in putting people in the use case with this um, tool that we have that we call Sphinx Gallery that is actually a spin-off from a from the scikit-learn uh, source code. So we have this way of having people writing Python code that are examples and these examples get automatically added to the documentation. They write a Python script and then we have system that make this, that convert this Python scripts into web pages and examples where you have the images, the plots, and really the documentation was there from day one. It's not like, okay, let's write code for three years and then, okay, how do we document this? You don't have code that comes into Cyclone if there's no doc, okay? If there's no documentation, then just write the documentation. Think of where this document should be added so it's, people can find it, and then this can get in. We have like a frequently asked question uh, entry in the web page that tries to explain why things cannot enter. So it needs to be cited and, and used enough uh, in the academic world, or it needs to be uh, an improvement on an algorithm that we already have. So imagine that you want to solve, I don't know, a support vector machine, and you come up with a, a faster solver to solve the exact same problem. So it's not a new, uh, a new machine learning model, it's just a better way of, of solving it. And then this can enter, but we need you to prove on various data sets that it's actually faster. So we ask you to do your homeworks and make sure that uh, we're really making a step forward. If you think of Cyclone as a, as a library that allow people to do science easily, one of the risks of making it easy is that you have more people and you have more chance of making big mistakes. Um, so the the way a cyclone is designed in terms of API and cross validations, and we have built in mechanisms to prevent people from making statistical mistakes. And one of these uh, um, mistakes can be avoided if you also come up with educational tools or I would say software algorithms or tricks or functions or anything that can allow people to quickly diagnose that they're making a mistake with their data. So you have all these uh, uh, issues in the input data, in why the model is working. Uh, if you can get a more, an easier diagnosis of why the technique is doing this, that can be why in the input data it, it went this way. Um, this can allow people to better open the box of these techniques. And I think there's a lot of efforts and a lot of money invested these days to, to have tools to do this, either at the conceptual or algorithmic level. But I think we need also tools like Scikit-Learn that allow people to apply these types of things on their real problems. Having a good way of looking at your data can be extremely insightful. You're not going to solve a prediction online predictive system with visualization. But I would say data science can, is very much influenced by good visualizations. And, and it's, I think it's hard to explain and it's hard to teach. You need experience to do this. And I think it's quite important to have, rather than diving deep uh, into predictive models, first look at your data and, 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 and do this quickly and efficiently. Um, and then you can, you can do a predictive model. But I think there's a lot of things that can be understood with visualization. I would say the, the sustainability has been a long issue uh, for many years. Um, 
so now we have this Cycle Learn Foundation that was started in France with se seven corporate partners that are funding uh, um, Cycle Learn by uh, I mean, kind of donation uh, to the project. Uh, and this will allow us to typically hire three engineers that are going to be working full time on Psychic Learn. This is really recent. Uh, this is really an effort uh, that we've been leading for the last year and a half, two years, and suddenly uh, became true last September. So we have this now core group of experienced historical co core contribution of Psychic Learn that can be uh, paid uh, to, uh, to keep maintaining and keep the project running. Um, and of course, the, if you want your library to survive, it needs to be still useful. So if we get like frozen in the, uh, in the state of the library in 2019 and nothing evolves, uh, I mean, probably some people will still use logistic regression in 10 years, but if you have some packages that do it 10 times faster than we do, maybe people will stop using scikit-learn. Mm -hmm.